Good afternoon, brilliant nerds, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We're here at Supercomputing 2023. My name is Savannah Peterson, and you're watching theCUBE. I'm joined by the fabulous Dave Nicholson, and we've also got a fabulous fellow analyst with us, Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you, fabulous. That's the nicest thing I've been called in weeks. That's because we were just getting to know each other, Brian. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> Give it time. Give it time. Yeah. Give it time. So, Brian Beeler, you're with storagereview.com. Mm -hmm. Obviously, an event with a lot of storage as, as front of mind. What's the, the number one conversation or thing you're seeing day one here walking around the show floor? Well, I mean, the, the best thing about Supercompute is the stuff. This is the It is show. a physical. This show, is for the sure. most stuff show of the calendar year. I mean, you guys go to all these trade shows. You've been to dozens of them this year as well, I'm sure. And so many are focused on high-level messaging, on maybe some solution stuff or as a service, but this mm -hmm. is very much stuff-oriented. And so I realize the supercompute audience is like, you called them, what'd you call them, creative nerds? Yeah. Okay, so half are creative software nerds, the other half are creative hardware nerds, and here we jumble them all up. But you can talk to somebody about uh, servers and GPUs and they'll have no idea, because they've never seen it before, because they're software nerds, and the hardware nerds don't really necessarily know about all the software. So this it's a great amalgamation of everybody, and since it's such a global audience, I have fun learning just what, talking to a guy last night waiting to get in. What's going on in India? I mean, that's where you are. What are you thinking about? Because it's totally. so different than what we sort of get myopically focused on in, in my world anyway sometimes. So I think it's a great reset. I'm really glad you brought up the global nature of that. We had someone from Dell who lives in Romania on the show. We also had some Belgian guests earlier. There's a whole Korean pavilion behind me. Oh, absolutely. Japan has a sticker activation going on for Booster on the show floor. We talk a lot, big key theme here is the democratization of AI and, and, and I feel like sometimes that's a real big buzzword, especially in the Valley. Coming to shows like this give me hope, and I'm curious if you guys agree, because I do see small startups, large enterprise, academics, government, and countries from all over the world collaborating to help build these future solutions. David, would you agree that's the good stuff, the magic? I think or is, my, am I just drinking my own community Kool-Aid? I, I, I thought my role here was to always disagree with you, Savannah. <laughs> we can, I mean. No, no. I, you know no. I don't mind a little confrontation. Yeah, no, no. No, I, I, I agree completely. It's, it's interesting. I mean, it is, a, it is absolutely a global gold rush in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. Number one thing, you know, when asked about the hype cycle, the answer is yes, the hype is a hype cycle, but it's real. Um, I think that the evolution that AI will bring is real. You mentioned folks in coming from the hardware perspective or the software perspective. Um, you focused on storage, right? For a period Primarily, of time. Yeah. Um, how has that changed? And do people appreciate it? I mean, just anecdotally, I can tell you I've had conversations with people who struggle over this idea of creating a quote unquote persistence layer like it's never been done before. Right. Um, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on the shifting sands of, of storage? Outside there's, of the array, inside of the array, in the server, out of the server. I mean, there's a million ways to go with that, and just as a point of clarity, when you say in the valley, I assume you mean the Ohio River Valley, or are you talking? That's exactly yes. what yeah, I'm referring to. I know you're yes. a Cincy boy, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, yeah. You <laughs> so in the, in the Ohio River <laughs> Valley, mind. we are very concerned about democratizing <laughs> AI, I love it, so Brian. I'll, I'll call give you that one call back, but I do think it's, <laughs> I didn't really know that that was a theme, but it's something that we've been talking about for a long time is that there's all these tools available, whether it's storage, GPUs, compute, any of these things, but they're not equally accessible, I would argue, to organizations of all size. So we're here looking at the HPC audience today, but there's a lot of enterprise customers here too, looking to see what these guys are doing at the bleeding edge, and how that will translate into enterprise solutions in the data center. Uh, Dell's here, we spent some time in their booth, they've got a number of GPU servers that are really great, uh, but it's not just so easy as placing the order and throwing this in your rack, there's all sorts of new things, and to your point about storage, networking and storage are a big part of that, because these GPU servers specifically are not storage heavy, they may have a drive per card in their configuration, so how do we fuel these GPUs? Because if I'm going to drop a, a million or a couple million dollars in, from an enterprise perspective into an enterprise data center to research, or to use AI to help re, uh, research or improve our businesses, or whatever we used to call business information or analytics you know, three years ago, um, <laughs> the, the, all the infrastructure's got to be there to support it. 
You said, are there changes? I mean, yeah, there are changes everywhere, but we're in this period that feels so fragmented. I don't know that there's one right answer because we could look at the banners scattered around here. You've got software-defined object storage that'll run on anything and it's cheap and deep. That's one thing. You've got uh, these big uh, parallel file systems. There's two over there. They, that, that's another thing. Uh, you've got the, uh, the standard file unstructured players uh, that, that have been after this market for, for decades. So it's wild. I don't know that there's any one thing happening. There's so many things happening which does make it even more challenging to sift through what's appropriate for your organization or your deployment. So in the, in the world that is storage review, hmm. uh, what I just heard you say is lots of job security. Because <laughs> per perpetual, yes. Perpetual job security, perpetual, <coughs> perpetual movement and change. Yeah, yeah, where, yeah. Where, where, where do you think these enterprise um, instantiations are going to occur? Do you think people will default toward uh, an older model of deploying things internally on premises? Or does the sort of fear of missing out that people experience now, is that the final push where it's like, okay, no, by default, this is going to be SaaS. We want this as a service delivered by, whether it's a hyperscale cloud provider or right. some niche service provider. Um, is this yet another nudge in the direction of cloud? Or is it a validation of hybrid? What, what, any, any thoughts? I mean, I, I think at the lowest level, the argument should start with your organization should be doing AI. Like, so that's like foundational thing, because if you're not involved, if you're, and I don't even think this is a Fortune 500 problem, I think this goes all the way down the stack. And depending on where you are in that stack, I think answers the question in terms of where you should be. Uh, I mean, you talked about democratization. I, I think this is so important because I think there's a ton of gatekeeping in this industry that I find really frustrating, that professionals that are in here that have been doing this for years will look at these infrastructures or storage or GPUs or servers and say, well, this is the way to do it with this software stack and this is the output and here's what you get. And if you're not doing it that way, you're doing it wrong. And I think that's a, uh, I mean, it's a little sickening, honestly, because- I agree with you, it grosses me out. Because these small yeah. organizations that are trying to do it, and they're starting with a workstation with a couple mm -hmm. A6000s in it, you're still talking about a $50,000, $60,000 investment in hardware. Yeah. And they're learning, and they're trying to do it, and they're trying to get better, and trying to figure it out. This is not, not AI, that's still AI, it's still productive, and this workload that can start on a workstation, the, I think the question is, where does it go next? Does it go to on-prem infrastructure? Does it go into the cloud, does it do both? And part of it's, I, I think, about cost and availability. We were told uh, just a week and a half ago that the wait for H100 systems, you place your order today, is somewhere around 40 weeks. Right. And so NVIDIA's doing the That's pivot. That's pretty wild. Well, uh, and, the wait, and the wait is for who? Not, not me getting one delivered to my house. There are very large organizations that are at the head of the line. Oh, absolutely, so, and, and they so will command. Yes, yes, so, so the average enterprise waiting for five of them versus someone who is buying as many as can come off of the assembly line right. as can be produced. So that's perhaps a driver you know, in terms of the where question, right? Is can I get access to the hardware? Yeah. Not everyone needs H100, and NVIDIA says, well look, we've got this shiny L40S, it's available now, re relatively speaking, right. a couple weeks. Um, and it's opening up the market, I think, too, for AMD, uh, Intel, and others with accelerators to come in with perhaps lower cost options that may not be quite so powerful, but the AI you can do today is better than the AI what you can do waiting for your GPUs to show up. Well, I mean, if we're talking about 40 weeks, that's a whole year of lost development, right. essentially. And there are a lot of cars that can get you over the finish line right now for a lot of different types get, of get processing. Get you something, right, which is, again, yeah. is better than nothing. Uh, but the cloud, of course, is, is very much a player too. As, as you said, we recently did some work with OVH Cloud, who's got uh, what would be considered by this audience sort of lower end V100s in the cloud. But again, I really think it's about accessibility and what can you get and affordability and how can you measure your investments in AI. If you're starting, it's a whole different set of metrics than if you're already succeeding and already have AI teams that can go in and leverage uh, an Oracle Cloud bare metal 8x8H100 but that's not free either. I mean, that's, that's a year commitment at a minimum and a lot of cycles that you've got to burn. So you've got to be ready to do it. And to your point about data, you've got to be able to move the data to these GPUs. So that's a whole nother issue with cloud-based GPU computing. 
It really is. I think, and, and just for anyone listening, I thought this was cool. We had Johnny Dallas, the founder of Zeet, on last night, and he's created a website, gpucost.com, okay. that shows you the availability, the pricing, and the providers of every one of these GPUs, and I've been scrolling through between some of our breaks, and it is wild, like you're talking about, to see the delays that we're seeing now, and anticipate what may happen as supply chain challenges become more complex and demand becomes higher moving forward. Having a strategy about your hardware right now, I think is absolutely imperative. Building on that, because I, I just think it's an awesome point and we haven't touched on it yet, and not as buzzy as it was last year because I think it's getting overshadowed by this very large AI presence in the room, is, is quantum and hybrid quantum. And when we're talking about processing speed, power, the amount of compute we're going to need there, how do you think that's going to affect the market? It's just another, another tremendous shift, right? And yeah. I, I think that's another strategy where maybe not today, right? But I think a lot, a lot of organizations, whether they're these big HPC installments or enterprise, are again, have to be evaluating it to see where that puck is moving to try to have a strategy there. And I think if this GPU availability has taught us anything, it's that the planning is absolutely critical and it's not like you know, the old days of pre-COVID where you could walk into your, your DISTI and buy whatever you wanted to buy and it'd be on your, your doorstep in a couple days or, or weeks at worst. Uh, much more strategic and there's so many more choices. Quantum's another one where, it's like, what am I trying to do with this? And really understanding what the output is that you're going after, what the benefits are of the technology and, and having a, uh, a plan to consume that, again, either on-prem or in the cloud or, or wherever. I mean, you didn't bring up Edge, that's the other big, that's the I other. Was, I was going to drive there, because we, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's another one, and another one where storage is making a big impact. We've got a, a project underway right now, actually, where we're developing our own LLM for scientific research. So, uh, Jordan, Great. yeah, it's pretty fun. We're going to open source it, too. But Jordan, who's on my team, has a passion for astrophotography. And so Ooh, when you rig yeah. up these high-res cameras to a, a, a telescope and you're out in the middle of nowhere, you've got um, all sorts of thermal issues, you've got power issues because you're going to have to use battery most likely to, to power these things, and you've got data issues because these guys do not want to get rid of any image they've ever taken because as the model gets better, what it does is it, at, a, at a very high level is it takes all these images, it runs through an inferencing engine at the mm -hmm. edge, or can run at the edge on a smaller GPU, and clean up the images, and then send back the final image to your data center for more deep, deep processing on something A100, H100, whatever. This whole data modality is tremendously punishing because you've got all this data, you've got Starlink is your best in, in class communication at the far edge, and you've got thermals and humidity and snow or dust and all these other things that are really terrible. So we've run this rig in Arizona. It's going, uh, we've got a new one uh, running on Dell XR servers with uh, these super dense Solidime uh, SSDs that now go up to 61.44 terabytes in a single U.2, which is amazing. So a server that has four bays can now support whatever that's, 61 times four. You know, uh, big math, I know. Yeah. Um, and, and we can really do all that, that data collection, but we're talking about data mobility to the cloud. We're looking at something where SneakerNet is still right. the fastest way to transport that data. And as much as we're all excited, or I'm excited about Flash and the high-end technologies here, there's two guys over there with tape libraries that are still <laughs> fundamentally where a lot of this stuff goes to reside that none of us want to get rid of. And tape, like, Flash is cool and all, but tape's sort of still pretty badass. I don't know, can we say badass on this show? We can now. <laughs> Too I late. give you permission. Too late, live. <laughs> My apologies. Don't apologize, it's all right. Well, John, John's flexible as long as it's the right audience. We're not going to offend anyone. We're giving our hot take. Hot take sometimes includes hot language. There we go. So there's, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's, I was thinking about it, I saw, and, and this is the first time I've seen this, there's a couple booths giving away GPUs. Which oh, is, yeah? first of all, that's how you know you're at supercomputing. Okay. But second of all, in the current state of things, I thought well, they should have somebody guarding that, depending on I, how nice it was. I would say so. I mean, you're watching the tracker. I mean, an H100 yeah. these days is what, 30K retail or something like yeah, that? Yeah, min. Yeah, I mean, even the L4s, which we've been using the A2s for the inferencing, which is like the easy you know, GPU solution, I think those guys in, in retail uh, volume are like 24, 2300 bucks. I mean, it's not nothing. This is a chunk of change that we are talking about. Yeah, I, I'm, I'd like to get your take on this. Um, I'll throw this out there. Okay. You tell me what you think. 
I'm curious about the utilization of all of the GPUs that have been installed Absolutely. out, especially in hyperscale cloud providers. Um, there is a race to make sure that they don't miss out. Mm -hmm. Along the way, that, that those supply chain issues, if you will, that arise, get people to take a closer look at what you can do without those GPUs. Yep. So training and inference aren't the same thing. Uh, inference doesn't have to, ha you know, inference when you're typing into an engine that is checking your spelling needs to happen right away. Inference doesn't always have to happen instantly, mm -hmm. and so there are massive cost breaks when you move away from using dedicated, most expensive hardware down to other tiers. And, uh, and so I see a battle shaping up among these sort of NVIDIA ecosystem versus the, hey wait, you can use more generic things more cost effectively, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, it'll be very interesting to see if, in fact, all of the people gobbling these GPUs right now are going to be able to effectively monetize them. You said first, everybody should be doing AI. I'm sure you would agree that what you meant was, first decide what the business problem is you're trying to solve. Oh, or what the, or what the you know, absolutely. It goes without saying. Then you decide, you know, are these tools something that I can, I can work with? feels like the hype cycle is driving a lot, of, a lot of activity, which is great for all of us. It'll be interesting to see utilization-wise. Do you have any insight into what that looks like now? Well, um, I wish, it would be great if the clouds would, would be a, a hair more transparent about you know, what is being used, because that might actually influence some other people's decisions and some consumption models that may be important for supply chain, as you Is know. anyone waiting to spin up a cluster uh, of, uh, of, of GPUs that are maybe virtualized with VMware running in AWS. Oh my are gosh. people waiting? Is oh there a gosh. three month waiting list you know, to, to get in? We talk about 40, 40 weeks, you can have a baby in 40 weeks, but you can't get a GPU? It's kind of. Yeah, I mean, I haven't compared it to, the, to baby uh, delivery. I was going to say, that a, was a really that's bold a, that's choice. That's a hard I, pivot, I, have, I like it. I have four kids, everything gets compared to babies at some point. <laughs> but, but uh, Mine are too old, I can't remember the, uh, the, the whole process, yeah. but I, I, I'll take your number <laughs> as, as fact. I mean, I, I think if you walked into any one of these clouds and said, I'm ready to sign a contract for a couple years for these uh, eight-way systems, I don't think you have a big problem gaining access to it. And the immediacy of the cloud has always been the historical benefit of the cloud, right? Um, but utilization, I mean, I think you even have to take that back to the workstations where we started at kind of the entry AI model or the, the lower cost inferencing cards. It's like, if you're going to make the 50, 60, $100,000 investment in these pieces of equipment, you want to make sure that that's up all the time. Uh, so we've got some great systems in uh, from the major workstation providers that are here, and one of the arguments we've been making lately is put these things in the data center and figure out how to intelligently provision them and share them with your team so that when you need one in yeah. your valley, which is a different time zone than my valley, we can get more utilization out of the machine and have better return on that hardware investment. But I think it's true through the whole stack. No one wants to drop a couple million dollars on a, on a big time GPU stack from uh, any of these vendors. I mean, we've been playing a lot with like the 9680 from Dell. Those things are absolutely amazing it must be used all the time or you're wasting, or at least not maximizing your investment on, on these things. So there's a lot of that to be, to be said and a lot of that to be figured out still, honestly, in terms of how we keep these things pushing all the time and get those insights. And then of course ask the right questions, as you said. That's, yeah. such, a, that's such a good point. We had, we had Grok uh, with a Q, not with, not, not with a K, not Elon's Grok on the show just before you. And it was, it, was, it was actually, we were talking about batches and how small batches can actually be incredible incredibly expensive to run to your point, not optimized, and, mm -hmm. and having inference tools like Grok, like other players in the game to help figure out when to run and how to optimize that makes the hardware worth the investment or not. I mean, to your point, I think it's a really Absolutely. interesting trade-off between. Plus they had a llama outside this morning. We, they, yeah, they yeah. Did. Heard, heard about that, which yeah. I, I still contend that it could be a wild herd of local llamas. Local llamas. Local yeah. llamas get loosened. That could be the headline. <laughs> could be a coincidence. SC23 interrupted by local llama herd. It, it could, but we're both from California, so we're not, uh, uh, you know, where is this Ohio place that you, of which you speak? <laughs> it's we just you, fly over yeah, it. Yeah, it's well, on your way to Boston and New York. You'll see it out the window if you take a beat. <laughs> truth, truth be told, I've been to Columbus twice in the last 30 days. You see, you're, so, not, you're not so bad. You yeah. can come down south and hang out in the lab. <laughs> which is one of the things, like, why I get so excited about hardware is because we've got a lab and we're touching these things and we're, we're setting them up and we're going through the pains and 
you know, much of it self-inflicted, I'll admit. We're not always uh, perfect and, and clean and tidy in our, uh, in our approach, but it's very pragmatic in terms of you know, getting these blade servers in. Getting, we've actually got four H100s in our lab right now, which is, um, I shouldn't say that when we're out of town. I was just going to say, what's, what's your code? What, what's the address? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ke Kevin's manning the lab, and uh, we've got the intern on 24-hour uh, on watch. But we're doing all sorts of crazy stuff. We've got liquid nitrogen coming in tomorrow, and we're going to do some overclocking world records, we hope. So there's so much out there. There's so much possibility. And I mean, you're talking too. I, I don't want to drive past this about what you do the work on. There's a lot of momentum around trying to do more AI work on CPUs, exactly. and not just the GPUs. And of course, you know, NVIDIA this week's talking a lot about Grace, Grace Hopper. We've seen systems from at least half a dozen vendors here that are either double Grace systems or Grace Hopper super chips. I mean, the, there's so much potential. And, and there's, to your point earlier about keeping busy and employed, I mean, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of work, a lot of work needs to be done in exploring these solutions, looking past vendor claims and saying, what are these things really good at? And, and not necessarily siloing those, but isolating the benefits of ARM architectures, of DPUs, of all of these things, and helping people sort out where the benefits are and, and to make reasonable uh, investment decisions. My goodness, what a fantastic series of insights. I want to call out one last thing before I close the show. I wish more folks named things after strong, badass women than uh, numbers and letters as a configuration. Grace Hopper as a platform versus you know, an H100. I feel like we can just get a little sexier with the naming. Brian Bueller, thank you so much for being here with Thanks us. Thanks for having me. Wonderful insights, and, and I look forward to having another chat with you again at some other Nerdfest. David, yeah. always a pleasure to share the stage with you. And always thank, a pleasure. Thank all of you brilliant Supercompute fans for tuning in to our live coverage here from the Mile High City. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for emerging tech news.